A human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects. Now I feel like I'm on camera. This is terrible. I'm All right. So, I mean, the whole idea of having a diversified <laughs> skill set is to be able to really, like, live up to your fullest potential as a human being. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, like, I guess in our day and age, there's a huge emphasis on specialization, especially at, like, a super early age. It's definitely it's trained. 100%. Like, it's to the benefit of the, the matrix system, if you will, the corporate america kind of system to have a nation of workers and not thinkers. yes and so you can kind of relate this to like the current way that the government and like corporations i guess are almost replacing the monarchy of old where it's like that is still somebody at the pinnacle and then there's all these people underneath it who are doing the brunt of the work it's like the colony of ants right, right. they were or bees right they work for the queen bee there's worker bees and then there's the queen bee and they're all working for the good of the queen essentially mm -hmm. right as opposed to i guess the fundamental principles that i guess you could say this country was originally founded on or something of that nature where it's a little bit more individualist i suppose but for the good of every working individual for the good of the populace correct yeah. the good for the, of the populace i suppose and so which ironically the good of the populace is the good of the individual because the better the individual becomes focusing on that means that you end up with a better populace exactly it's a little backwards to what's intuitive but that's really what is required to make a, a strong populace to the best of its ability yeah well just think about it i mean the the better the individual the healthier the stronger the smarter the individual the more innovative they're going to be the better they're going to be able to solve problems that's going to push society forward so to your point earlier like the way that we're sort of bred is to be a worker like the way the school system is set up and things of mm -hmm. that nature is for the idea of creating worker bees to serve a purpose outside of themselves that's not really <clears throat> feeding back into the populace mm -hmm. and that's um, exactly what specialization really does exactly it really specialization that. makes you a good worker because you have a specific skill set you create your own job essentially you create a niche for you that that's what you have to go fill now mm -hmm. and it's doing a job for something else and so I think there's a lot of value in diversifying your portfolio, I guess, as it were, in like terms of skills and abilities and knowledge base so mm -hmm. that you can have a, a broader perspective. You have different perspectives now on mm -hmm. the same problem that is, if you only focus on one thing, then that is your worldview, right? That Those are your blinders. That's all you can think of. And that's the only way you can approach a problem. But if you know things about different fields and then you have these different perspectives, you can create more creative solutions to problems than Absolutely. you otherwise would have been able to. So what about, uh, what would you say to people who they want to be a specialist? That's what their life purpose is. They I would found say that that's one thing to go for. That's okay, right? If, if that is what you want to do, if you are so passionate about one thing and that is all you want to do with your life and you find so much fulfillment in that, do it. Because there's value in that, right? You get to go so deep and bring mm -hmm. so much expertise to one specific thing. We need those people. We need those people. 100%. That's actually a really good point to bring up because, you know, we're talking about being a generalist, kind of, you know, talking down on being a specialist a little bit, it seems like, but that's not really what, it, what it's all about, right? It's really just about finding your optimal highest potential and fulfilling it. That's and that's really exactly what it comes it. down to. And, and even then, I think... If your goal is to be the best specialist that you can be, you can get a lot of benefit from taking in those external perspectives, connecting dots from seemingly unrelated areas and understanding how everything connects. And that'll actually boost your main thing. 
so exactly. much more. Exactly. And so, and if you even want to go deeper before I forget this. <laughs> yes, deeper. When understanding things beyond just your own niche or other, other niches as well, but even within how your body works, how your mind works, how your spirit works, things like that are really fundamental for how you show up in the world in your specific niche on your mission that's going to optimize it so much more like if you figure out how your body works optimize your nutrition your health your mental capacity things like that you're going to be way better off for your specific niche so even being a generalist kind of in the background almost can be hugely beneficial if you want to be a specialist in the forefront totally i mean you kind of hit it because it's the idea that like the more things you start to understand the more different fields you start to learn, the more different subjects you start to like engage with, you start to uncover similarities between them all. They're not different. And that, that's just it, right? So if you can start to extract the underlying principles of these different things, you start to see that they're all the same. They're all the same. And then you, you have these fundamental principles of sort of how everything works. And then you can take that and extrapolate that out into any context. And so even if it's a subject that you don't know anything about, you can learn it very quickly mm -hmm. because those principles still apply there, mm -hmm. right? That's what makes a principle a principle is that it applies anywhere. And so the more things you start to learn about, you start to connect these dots and like, oh, wait, this is like this. And oh, wait, that's like that. And you start to form this web of like principles. And then you can even bring those new things and be like, oh, this dot relates to this dot. So I can bring everything connected to that dot all the way over here. And then you can bring a whole unique perspective. And that's really where creative, a lot of creativity comes from is not making new dots. It's connect, making the connection between dots that weren't there before. Exactly, 100%. And so there is a, there is a quote um, that kind of exemplifies the idea it puts it very well of having multiple skill sets and, and becoming a very well-rounded person right mm -hmm. that it's the idea of like a renaissance man right the the old school line of thinking of like leonardo da vinci and those types of people where they were you know architects mathematicians artists painters sculptors engineers engineers like athletes all these philosophers people. everything at once and it was kind of epitomized to be the ultimate form of yourself because that's in the all these fields that's the capacity of a human being like we're kind of unique among yeah a lot of other animals and and, and you'll make it'll make sense when i read the quote here in a second we're it's, it's always standing out amongst the animal kingdom in a way because we have the capacity to do more yes right and and in some sense if you have the ability to you you almost have the responsibility to like i mm. i think i find that at least for me I resonate with that a lot. <laughs> you know, it's, it's why people climb mountains because it's there. It's like, well, I have to climb those mountains within myself because I know I can. And yeah. otherwise, I'm not fully reaching what I know I can be and I'm leaving something on the table and that's something that I find personally unacceptable. For sure. So this will make a lot more sense. So this is a quote by Robert Heinlein. Uh, he's a science fiction author and this is from a book, Time Enough for Love. He says, A human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects. Yeah, that's pretty powerful, right? Because to your point of humans having this very large capacity for achievement on so many different levels and to truly fulfill that like you should be able to explore all those different facets of your your and abilities if you notice too a lot of the things he was saying in his quote they're seemingly opposing like they the he's saying that a human being should be able to take on roles that are often seen as like incompatible like take orders give orders you can't do both of those at the same time right but you should be able to right and it, it's being able to toggle back and forth and, and use one in the right context and the other in the right context mm -hmm. as, as you navigate as you through life. Right? Yeah. And so it's, it's the idea that like insects, most bugs, at least to my knowledge, are a bug is like it's designed for kind of like a purpose, like one thing, right? 
very task oriented. Very task oriented in the way the bug is designed. Like that's what it's supposed to do. You know, a ladybug is a very different bug than like a spider, which has the capability to like build webs and trap things in its web and eat them. And that's like kind it's of physically designed for that. How it, but not operates. much else. Exactly. And so that lends itself again to the idea of a worker bee and worker ants and whatever doing things for the queen is because they have certain jobs based on their capabilities mm -hmm. and that's what they're good at and that's what they do but we as human beings we're better than that we're so much better than that we're better and than we us. just have the capability to just do so much more and i think also it's incredibly like empowering to think this way as well there's a quote by leon batista alberti mm, who man. is like kind of the prototype renaissance man like pre michelangelo very, pre da vinci all those people kind of like pioneered the idea of being being a renaissance man like having all these different skill sets i mean he was an architect it's probably what he's best known for but he was also known for his other art and different ventures mathematician philosopher philosopher yeah. all these different things and he says that a man can do all things if he but wills them Right? So basically, if you put your mind to it, you can literally do mm -hmm. anything. It's just very empowering to think like that. It's, it's just the acknowledgement and the belief in yourself, basically. 100%. To be able to do more. Ab absolutely. And, and just the trust that, hey, I see someone else doing that thing, right? I, I see someone else achieving these certain things or accomplishing certain goals, and they're no different than me. Because they're a human. I'm a man. They're a man. I can do all things if I but will them. If I really put my mind to it and I really desire that to happen, really commit to it, burn the ships, if you will, it's going to happen. And I believe that. And I can only Absolutely. really hold that belief if I believe, or if I also believe in my ability as a human being to be able to adapt and to change and be able to do all these yes. things. So that's why it's so important to me, at least to be able to connect these dots and be the renaissance man that yeah. I know I can be. And I think that's why we actually like hold these types of people like to such esteem. Like you look at somebody like David Goggins, right? What if you guys don't know who David Goggins is, like immediately stop this and Google him and then Please. come back. But David Goggins, right, does these incredible like feats of endurance and, and you, physicality and stuff like that imagine someone not knowing what, what who we are and not david Goggins. that's funny <laughs> to me that's true that's fair Shout uh, out to the so if you've gotten person. this far you probably know who david goggins is but anyway david got right like you look at these just ridiculous feats but at the same time you look at it and be like wait a second he's human he looks like me i'm a human i can do that or at least i have the capability to do something like that and that's so powerful because that's why these people are so inspiring. That's like why they, how they inspire things in other people is because they go and do them. That kind of gives permission for other people to like live their best mm -hmm. selves and become their best selves, right? That's, a, yeah, that, that's such a fulfilling purpose is giving people permission to become themselves, like really yes. who they're meant to be, like that's about their fullest potential. That's why we're here. And, you know, it, it's really cool to think that, like, we have that potential and, you know, we're kind of of the thought process that a good way to go about starting to fulfill that potential is by exploring different facets of life, different subject matters, and becoming more versed in more things, right? Because mm -hmm. you become a lot more well-rounded. And it, I just want to make the distinction between the common idiom of, like, jack of all trades master of none of oh if you do too many things you you just will be trash because all that is a, a a very real thing and and you have to be aware of that too when you know you're going on the journey that we're here for you because that is a very real thing right yeah. like you can absolutely be very surface level in so many things and make maybe sound smart at a couple of parties like maybe people <laughs> will like you for yeah, that yeah, yeah absolutely but you'll um, have no depth and then, you know, when you go home at night, you're, you're going to know that. And you're going to know that, wow, I'm not really doing anything with this. Where am I going? What am I building? Who am I serving? Like, you're not yeah. really living up to your potential. So this is the distinction we're going to make right now. Definitely. You have to make the distinction because, like, again, if, if you're going to go about really doing something with this, which, 
again, it's it's not just about like looking cool or having these knowledge bases just to know things. It's like having a depth of knowledge in a variety of fields, like not only gives you the the ability to kind of extract these principles that we talked about, but you're also gonna be a lot more adaptable when you come up against problems in your life because you're mm -hmm. gonna be able to come at it in different angles. You have a larger data set. Like a lot of, you know, what, what how the human mind works and how we approach problems is, is we try to connect new things with what's familiar, right? So if you're intentional about exposing yourself to things that are unfamiliar and, and, and things that are a little bit, you know, outside of your normal day-to-day -day wheelhouse, you're gonna have a larger data set to pull from and make connections to better face new challenges from a stronger angle with higher leverage. Absolutely, you're just gonna be so much more adaptable with anything that's thrown at you. And I think too, your, your ability to communicate with people is gonna be enhanced because now you have so many experiences to pull from to be able to relate to people on, on different levels and different you, types of people that you're gonna be able to communicate so much more effectively to really anyone. 100%, now. and even if you're not gonna be an expert in everything, because that's really, really hard. And frankly, you just don't have enough time or attention to do, to be like a, a complete world-class expert at every single thing. Like the numbers just don't make sense. Like you can get pretty far, but whatever. You're gonna be able to add to every conversation. You're gonna be able yeah. to contribute a new perspective because you not only know enough about whatever you're talking about in the moment, but you also have a ton of other dots that connect and pull from to be able to add those new perspectives and really start building something new, adding yeah. to that conversation and contributing some sort of novelty there. Definitely. Um, and it's definitely, it's definitely cool to be able to, to know all these things and to have this ability and stuff like that. But to your point, like, we are finite as humans. Like that's something we need to realize is that we are finite and we have limited capabilities. Even though I think our capabilities are far beyond what most people will see them as, mm -hmm. there is a ceiling still, right? There's, if anything, there's a time ceiling. And so it, the, the question becomes, <laughs> the question, yes, you're gonna die just like straight up. So the question becomes like, what are you gonna do about it? And so the other question becomes, how do you go about actually doing this like let's make it practical for a second mm -hmm. how do you go about becoming a like renaissance type man sounds where you good have but it's hard all of these like capabilities like jack of all trades master of many potentially mm -hmm. right and it, you know it comes down i think to focus right where and, and i don't just necessarily mean focus as in like right in the moment like acute mental attention necessarily but like a broader sort of focus and i i kind of like to make the distinction between like micro focus and macro focus right mm. where micro focus is that acute attention based in the moment type focus where you're focused right, right now the, the good analogy for micro focus is literally like a, a lens focusing some light you know so if you have like sunlight whatever and you have this big spot it's never going to burn anything Right? But if you focus it down at the right distance with the right lens, you have all that yeah. energy focused on one individual thing, you're going to make a lot happen. It's going to be a very narrow focus, and whatever you're pointing your attention on, you're going to make a dent. You're going to burn that hole. You're going to make progress. Yeah. And then you contrast that to the idea of macro focus, right? which really is just resource management across a longer period of time. Right? That's a very fundamental principle as well, just resource allocation. You see that everywhere. Right now we're just talking about in terms of focus and, and general resource management within your own life, but that's a very fundamental principle. You see at all levels from, from the insects all the way up to just civilization as a whole. It's always just about how resources are managed and the relationship between them. Yeah, and so I guess when it comes down to doing things with your own life, whether that's pursuing a goal of becoming a renaissance person or not like resource management because we have limited resources right as human beings and i think really as we go through life we have kind of three main resources one is time mm -hmm. time is very limited we don't really know how much we're going to get 
which makes it incredibly, incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. And it is also the resource that you cannot get any more of. You have a limited amount and that's all you're going to get. Increasingly more scarce. It, exactly. And yeah, but it's, it's interesting because it's also kind of a great equalizer because despite your talents, your abilities, whatever, you all have, like everybody has the same amount of time in each day. You're right. Right. So it's this very, very finite resource, mm -hmm. right? The second resource is energy, mm -hmm. right? The energy that you have. And by energy, I guess I mean like your ability to accomplish things, the ability to do work, to make change, to do things, right? And so you have like physical energy, you have mental energy, you have like emotional energy, you have these resources at your disposal to be able to go like actually do and accomplish things, mm -hmm. right? And then the third resource is essentially money or basically some sort of thing that you have that other people find valuable in a So are you like talking just something. in terms so, of any, any sort of uh, measure of exchange? Yes. Yeah, means so of exchange, basically? It's, it's like a financial currency of some mm -hmm. kind, something that, also, something that you have that's valuable. Could you, could you also count... Um, in that sort of like a more like a bartering system or like a trading of like talents and things like that like a you scratch my back I'll scratch yours service sure. based thing y yes but I mean you also have to consider that that could fall into the category of energy too like your mm, ability I guess you to could. do things right. so it's more of a finance mm -hmm. type thing when whether that's money whether that's tradable goods whatever that is you have things of Me value. means of exchange you have things that other people find valuable so gotcha. right, you've got time you've got energy and you've got money essentially mm -hmm. How you utilize those three things sort of determines the outcome of your life in a lot of ways. Mm, right? I agree. And so people are discouraged, I think, from pursuing multiple things because they think, I don't have enough resources. I'm spread too thin. I do think people, most people probably are spread too thin. They are diluting their resources across too many things. However, I think a lot of those things are trivial. There's a lot of fluff in people's lives. Absolutely. If you just have a little bit more resource consolidation, you're going to have a lot more to That's apply exactly to what, what it is. It's resource consolidation to the things that really matter. The problem is people don't have a strong enough filter or North Star guiding them towards what really matters to them. That's huge. That they sort of just spend their resources on whatever. Think That's about it huge. this way. Like you Think about it just in money, right? That's a very relatable topic is like, if you have $100, you go to the store with $100 to buy things, right? If you're walking up and down the aisles and just being like, oh, that looks cool. I'm going to spend, eh, it's only $5. I'm going to spend $5 on that. Sure, That's throw fine, it on. whatever. Throw it in. I have $95 left. You go through whatever. You find something else cool. It's $10. You find something, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. I'm going to get a few of these things. By the time you get to the things you actually need, like food, water, you don't have that much money left to spend. So, of course, you're going to feel like you don't have the ability to do that. You've already used it all, right? You've already used it up. But if you go into it with like this idea that, okay, I need to get food and water because my goal of going to the store is making sure that I survive. Mm -hmm. I have enough to survive. And then you go in with this purpose and then that becomes a decision-making filter yeah, on keep, how you your spend your resources. 100%. Right? Keep, keeping your priorities straight through that process by having that clear, clear vision and purpose in your life, having that North Star it, it, it's really the the pace setter, the tone setter for your priorities. Definitely. And so that comes back to the idea of focus, right? It's like if you have this purpose, these values, these underlying values of like kind of what makes you tick, then everything is going to relate back to that, right? Mm -hmm. And you can use, you can toggle back and forth between this macro focus of this is my big goal. These are my values. This is what I want to get to. And then you, you know, allocate your resources accordingly to different ventures in your life that's going to lead you there. And if it doesn't lead you there, it's like you don't even bother spending resources on it. So you have a lot more left over to spend on the cool things that actually move the needle, right? But then when you're actually doing the thing in the moment, that's when you need to bring in the micro focus, mm -hmm. right? So micro focus is necessary to accomplish a task, whereas macro focus is necessary to accomplish a goal. 100%, right? It's a very clear like, distinction. And like you need to be able to toggle back and forth between the two and be like, right now in the moment, I am going to focus my attention on getting this thing done. Whereas I think attention is also something that gets 
kind of floundered away as well, just like a currency it, would. It really does. Where, well, let's, I guess let's define like what we mean by attention to, right? Like attention to me is a combination of two of the resources, like energy and time, right? Mm. So it is, it's a function of energy per unit of time. So it's like, how much energy are you spending something per unit of time? So if I'm talking to you, Interesting that you say that because that, that sounds, it's like an efficiency metric. It is. Of, of how well you're using your energy given the amount of time that you have to work on that thing and, and just really being efficient with it. And, and this, I'll just say this now because we're, we're on this topic. I, I was going to say like with your three metrics of like time, energy, and some financial component, personally, I, I view the financial component as just a means of stored energy. Right. So like money is just, hey, I have this saved up amount of energy that I can either spend to cash in that energy so someone else can do something for me or something. So it really is just sure. a matter of like potential stored energy. So you really are kind of left with like energy and time. Right. And the relationship between those and how that relates to attention is kind of all there is realistically in terms of your resources. Right. In terms of like what you can control with your resources, at least. And applying energy per unit of time from like a physics perspective that is the definition of power like the unit of a watt is a joule per second yeah. a unit of energy per unit of time and so you can kind of manipulate the relative ratios of these things to increase the amount of power and therefore influence that you really have in the world and what you're acting on right so you can increase your power by having more energy right that's pretty basic the more energy you have the more powerful you are, right? But there's also that element of time, and this is why it's super related to, and super interesting when related to this idea of attention, when you can reduce the amount of time that it takes you to do something versus someone else, or even you yeah. did it last week or last month, you now have become that much more powerful, right? So if I can do something in half the time, I'm twice as powerful, right? with the same amount of energy or the same thing that I'm doing. Exactly. Right? So manipulating those two and the ratio between them is super, super important to be aware of when you're trying to make big things happen and manage your attention. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point too with the time thing, especially when you are trying to do something like become very versed in a lot of different things. When you're trying to do a lot right. of different things, you have to be very, very good because you can only do one thing at a time. Like really, we're not trying to tell you to spread yourself too thin and do everything all at once. That doesn't really work. You're, you're not going to make yeah. much progress on it. So we're, we're still applying this concept of deep, minuscule micro focus across macro focus at any given time on one thing. Definitely. Right? Because if, if you can... If you can do more work per unit of time, you're going to be a lot more efficient. And so you're going to be able to do a lot more things in a day, in a week, in a month, in, in a five lifetime. years, in a lifetime. That's where this capacity comes in, right? It's like we have this huge ceiling of capacity to be able to do so many different things with our lives. But we really need that, that focus to be able to allocate the resources well enough and to be able to manage our time well enough to actually be able to accomplish those things. So you, you can accomplish these things. You can become very well versed in many different subjects, but you just have to manage the time and your energy. Absolutely. Right? Effectively there. Dropping some knowledge. So, this is so serious right now. I mean, <laughs> knowledge is... That's a strong word, I suppose. But um, in my studio with my so I guess bonsai. if you are going to if you are going to pursue <laughs> if you are going to pursue something like this, where you know you want to learn a lot about a lot of things, mm -hmm. it is important to create some level of structure, right? It's like I think this is one of the the fundamental principles that at least helps me quite a lot. Structure is required. Is the idea of like variability within a structured system. That is huge. Structures required for creativity and innovation. You think it's backwards, right? Because you don't want to put these constraints on ideas like creativity. Because, oh, I want to be free. I want to do everything that I want to do. And, and no, no rules, no constraints, whatever. 
But that, where does that really lead you? You're kind of going in just an empty void of nothing. There's nothing to build off of, nothing to really move towards, right? So you have to have the structure. Like even if you're climbing a mountain, it's like you have to have a mountain, right? It's how you navigate that mountain. It's how you apply yourself and connect the dots within the given structure and use what's available to you being resourceful in those resource allocation, that's really where the creativity lies, right? It's the idea of not just synthesizing things from literally nothing, but using what's given to you available, having those constraints and understanding your level of variability within them and choosing the most creative outcome to really make it make a dent, make yes. a move in the world. And so, you know, it is, it seems like doing all these different things, right? Math, science, art, fitness, like whatever, all, if you're going to try to pursue all these different things, like that's a lot of variability within your, within your life, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to somehow create some level of structure to operate within so that you're able to maintain direction. You're able to make measurable progress within these things. So the micro focus comes in, the macro focus comes in, and then this overall structure of how it all ties together comes in. And so the way that we've kind of decided to structure our own sort of pursuit down this road is to have, like to categorize different fields of study that we think different things would fall under. So we have mm -hmm. sort of seven categories yeah. that we're going to start to pursue and start to explore within these different, mm -hmm. these different fields will fall under these categories. 100%. And like... Part of me is, is, so this does come with a caveat though, even though we're kind of categorizing things into these little boxes and things like that, I hate, I hate boxes, right? Like th that's a whole nother conversation on its own of how much of society and modern civilization is really structured around putting people and keeping people in boxes at every stage in their day, at every stage in their life. Like a lot of people probably heard, you know, you, you know, you wake up in your box, your bed, right? You drive to work in your box, your little car. You go to work and you sit in your little cubicle, that's another box. After that, you go back home, you watch the little glowing box of the TV. And you know, your life is all structured around these boxes. And I, I don't like the idea of that because it, it puts, as soon as someone identifies with a box, they identify with the boundaries of the box. And therefore they think they can no longer permeate through those boundaries, right? There's no overlap. I am this. I am an accountant. I am a scientist. I am an athlete. Yes. And therefore, anything that is not within their pre-decided box is rejected because that's not who I am. I've been conditioned to stay inside this totally. box. So that's just a caveat I will say. With these categories, this is just to organize focus, right? Absolutely. These are just your lenses. It's what we're choosing to focus on at one particular time, but there will always be overlap. There will always be connections to other yeah. dots, through these categories, right? So like when we're talking about science, I mean, there's 100% gonna be <laughs> connections from like the human body, like your DNA, biology, things like all those kind of interrelations as well. And you know, how we think about them, the philosophy aspects of it, and even how that may, may, maybe relates to like financial aspects of things, because science is expensive, it costs money, things like that, you know, there's always gonna be overlap. So thinking of them as boxes is incorrect. It's more of yep. just, here's our, conglomeration of individual momentary focuses. Yes, that's exactly right. And just real quick to kind of touch back on what you just said before I forget on the idea of, of being in a box and like, I am an accountant, I am a scientist, I am this. The idea of specialization, again, if that's what you want to do, by all means, please go for it. But you can be a better accountant but, if you're also a better athlete, I promise you. Because you have different experiences to pull from, you have different different perspectives, but also, Having multiple skill sets makes you free. It really gives you freedom of choice to do what you want to do with your life. Because if you only have a skill set of, I'm a doctor, that is all that I can do, that is the only skill that I have, then that is the only thing you can do in your you're life. You're never you, going to be more because you, you've decided you, you're never going to be more. You, mm. You've put yourself into that box. You do not have a choice. That is all you have. So if you have a diverse set of skills, you now can choose what you want to do. You are actually free to do what you want with your life. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have access to 
a certain pathway, you really don't have the choice to be there. Exactly. Right? If all the doors are locked but one, you yeah. have no choice which door to walk through. You can only walk through one, right? Look at all the options. So basically, Whoa, they're all locked. Learning about but different things unlocks all the doors so that you can choose which one you want to walk through at what time in your mm -hmm. life. You can walk through all the doors, just not all at once. You can walk out and then go through another door and then go through another door. You, you, you can't walk through all of them at once, but you can do more than you think you can. So the categories that we have decided to sort of put together to kind of, like he Guide said, the focus. conglomerate the momentary focuses, right? Because you focus on one thing acutely, that, that um, short-term focus, that builds and builds and you can take these different topics and sort of connect them all together. But the first one, math, science, innovation, and technology. My roots. <laughs> Let's go. Right, so that's, that's your typical sort of learning about mathematics, learning about science, these hard sciences, things like that, and then connecting that into general innovation, inventions, technology, technological advances, and things like that, and exploring that sort of realm. The next one is art, which obviously includes things like painting and sculpting and music, music, music. architecture, origami, like anything that is an expression of art falls under this category and this is an interesting one because I think a lot of people have a yearning to do art but maybe never take the time to develop the skills to do it so here's it's interesting because there's a steep learning curve there's a steep learning curve but it's interesting but because it's short. art art is one of those things where I think a lot of people most probably everybody has something inside them like emotionally that they want to express but if you don't have the skill set to express that through Dude, the art it's medium, just like a child before they learn how to speak, exactly, they have thoughts, exactly. they have things they want to communicate. I'm hungry on this, but they just don't know how, so they scream. Exactly. A lot of people are at that infantile stage in their artistic journey. They're just screaming on pages if they're just trying to totally. draw something. Just screaming it's with a pen. Gibberish, right? So it's 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 understanding that it is part of the process and part of the journey, and the learning curve is steep. But just like a child, it's pretty short. They learn how to talk pretty fast, right? It's a steep yeah, curve, but totally. it's short, right? Art is really the same way. Anyone can do it, right? And there's a ton of different ways to engage with it as well. It's not just limited to, oh, you have to make yeah. a painting. You have to be able to paint the Mona Lisa or you're not going to be a Renaissance man. <laughs> Sorry, you're not part of the it, It's just finding a way to express something emotionally through the artistic medium and I do think it is very valuable to learn the skill of an art medium in some way that resonates with you because then you have an outlet and a way to express that Dude, now. You can you so much speak. You're toddler at parties too. That now you can speak. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, plus it's cool. It's great. It's like, really cool. It's you, cool. You just bust out like, oh, I'm also an artist and I can paint these things or I can make this thing. And everyone's thing, like, right? oh, that's it's so sick. sick. Yeah, 100%. Or you're, you want to be that guy. Dude, <laughs> if you can pull out like, Somebody just says, like, give me a dollar bill. Takes a dollar bill, folds it into some crazy origami thing, gives it back. Like, at a party. I love that. Especially if anyone's a little tipsy. Dude, just pff, mind blown. So, art. Good art is that. the second one. Art is important. Art is important. And it just, I guess for a second, too, like, think about the, the implications of art culturally over the millennia. It's like, undeniable. It's an undeniable, like, piece of who we are as humans. To Why create, not add to that conversation? To create, you know? And so art is a very, very great way to create. And so I think it's pretty important. And then here's where it ties in, because you can tie it in other things, right? Or you can already tie that into science and math like already. Yeah. Like there is so much overlap. We'll get to that art later. It's great. <laughs> and, and history, you can tie it in. Like history and finance and like really literally everything. That's why it's all, everything's connected. Everything is connected. If you take anything away from this, everything is connected. That's why it's okay to do lots of things because it's all the same thing. Yeah, you're not at actually the root, doing... like at the fundamental. It's all the same. I know people always tell you to focus, find your niche or whatever. It's like, well, your your niche is it's all the same thing anyway. Yeah, you're just expressing it in different ways on different days. Like, you're not actually doing different things. Totally. You're living. One hundred percent. You're living. You're being human. It's, it's, you're being it's human. Expressing your life. Humans are diverse. Be human. Be human. That's what we're telling you to do. Be better than a bug. The, th <laughs> the third one is mental optimization, which encompasses like psychology, philosophy, like mindset, 
stuff. We can talk about that later. <laughs> and, you know, that's important because that's obviously like your brain, right? It's like your Optimizing thoughts. how your, your mind works is a huge part of optimizing how your external reality manifests. And I mean that in terms of a, a very secular and metaphysical way. Like, 100%. we'll get into that all, right? That's how you process things. And I, we don't mean this necessarily, like, in terms of just your, just your neurology, just your neuroscience and things like that. That's a huge part of it as well, because that's, like, your physical hardware. But beyond that, like, your, your mind is something beyond the physical structure of your brain, right? And it's understanding how you think, how you learn, how you interpret the things that happen in the world and, and the reality around you is super duper important to be able to navigate things and make things happen that you want. Yeah. It, it is fundamental across the board. You're never not using your mind and your brain and, and optimizing it Absolutely. because you're never not, as long as you're alive, you're never not experiencing life. Exactly. And I mean, I think people too start to, dude, this is just a thing with, Human beings trying to learn things, we compartmentalize everything. Boxes. Boxes. We create boxes around certain subjects. Disgusting. If you think about it, just like, like a doctor has to learn about the human body and they compartmentalize each system in the human body, like cardiovascular system, the muscular system, the nervous system, and they just learn about them in isolation. And then they chuck you a human, which is a glob of just everything <laughs> soup together. And they're like, <laughs> fix this. And like, uh... I'm going to try, right? But it's like, the thing is, you cannot separate these things. They are intertwined, whether we like it or not. Creating these momentary boxes, again, momentary focuses, right, is a way for us to, like, wrap our monkey brains around these also just in to implement. infinitely like complex only, topics, you can, like the body. I would recommend only doing surgery on one thing at a time, <laughs> you know? So True. it's just to compartmentalize implementation as well in proper sequence right but you're not only doing one thing like each step is something different right and so you can't really separate the mind and the mental side of things from the physical like they are it's a two-way street and they're always connected your entire you experience of reality is is within your mind is a, is a yeah. consequence of that so why not optimize it why not experience that, the best you can that will bring us to our fourth category which is physical optimization right? So things like health, fitness, getting big, biology, and even like sport, right? So it's this manifestation of you as a human in the physical, right? So it's, it's such the, the classic, um, it's, it's a huge element of like the classic Renaissance man as well. You know, like mm -hmm. you have all these sculptures of like the Greek gods and Achilles and <laughs> yes. and things and, like that. Even the things that like Leonardo da Vinci or... Mm -hmm. Like I'm those gonna types find a, of I'm people gonna find another created, quote here because we're gonna do it. The types of things that those people created were like archetypes of like the ideal human in their mind, right? Which almost always had a very strong physical form in one way or another. But during the period of the Renaissance, like that became a theme in a lot of the art was picturing like depicting people as strong and robust physically. Because they valued that, right? 100%. They saw the value of physical 100%. strength. So this is a quote um, from Socrates, my boy, my man, my, my main, main man. No, no man has the right to be an amateur in the matter of physical training. It is a shame for a man to grow old without seeing the beauty and strength of which his body is capable. Fact. It's, it goes back Fact. to just the responsibility that you have when you understand the capacity that you have as a human, the heights that you can reach, knowing that you can and choosing not to is a damn shame. Like, it's, yeah. it's criminal. <laughs> I 100%. Think. I mean, it's, it's negligence, frankly. It's, it, it is negligence. It's personal it's, it's, negligence. It's like a plant. It's like you're, you're really not growing into your fullest potential as a great tree that you can become. So what's a bonsai? I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Art. <laughs> art. <laughs> Bonsais are art. <laughs> um, little, little trees. Mighty. Yeah, trees. And, and it's obviously very important as well because, you know, it goes back to the fact that all the systems in your body are connected. And so 
the better you make your physical form, the better everything on the inside and is going to run. We'll, we'll get to that too in later episodes. But just the connections too with how, like just, just the correlations and how much your life improves when you have a, a healthy physical being. Yeah. How that influences your brain, your work you do, your emotional integrity and intelligence and your, your strength of that. It's just across the board. And also like, we we talked about before, like your only resource is your time and energy. Both of those are heavily directly correlated to your body. That determines in a large way your, your natural lifespan and also how you optimize your body determines how much energy you have at any given yep, day, totally right? 100%. Going in from the cellular genetic level all the way just up to the larger systems of your body, it's all connected to your finite resources. Mm -hmm. You're here in this body yes. of whatever this is and whatever life ex we call the experience we call life, and you got to take care of that, man. So yeah, if you want to be able to do more with your life, like you have to develop it's your the capacity vehicle. to do more. It's your vehicle. It's like yeah. you're just rental vehicle, man. And I want to be <laughs> riding in style. We're here to drive Bugattis, it's not not Toyota Corollas. Exactly. <laughs> Let's go. And yeah, one hundred percent. All right. Next category is um, like finance and business, which I guess we'll call financial optimization. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, as much as, you know, you can have different perspectives on money. It's resource Money allocation. matters, money doesn't matter, talk whatever. About that. It's resource allocation. It is, it is a valid resource, right? And so to completely neglect it and leave it off the table it's is foolish. doing a disservice, right? Because it exists. And it is a valuable resource. And so it's something that you have that at your disposal. It's a lever. You're a lot more like amicable when you're explaining this. Like I, I have far beyond justifying w myself when I talk about money. Like I don't, I don't even feel the need to talk about it like that anymore. It's like, oh, I know some people think about it like this. Like, no, it's just, I want money. Here it is. I can do this with it. Cry about it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I respect that. I don't think you need to justify that anymore. Well, I mean, that gets into the, well, that can be probably a discussion for a different day. The idea of like m different values around money and money is stored energy and that yeah, it will exactly. enhance you whatever you apply it. it towards. That's exactly it. Money is a tool, right? It just depends on how you use that tool. 100%. Um, Building a house or is it going to be a Warhammer? Exactly. It doesn't make the tool bad. You just have to use it right. Hammers kill people, apparently. Ha Oof. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Yikes. <laughs> Moving on. Okay. Number six, history and societal trends. Right? Can't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. It's just understanding context, like fundamentally. 100%. In order, like, you know, I know a lot of times in school you're taught to... Like, like cheating is antagonized and you're taught not, like, not to do it and it's bad or whatever. It's like, dude, life, you don't really have those same type of rules. Like you want to find someone who's done what you're trying to do in some way and rip them off for all they're worth, man. Absolutely. Like, <laughs> there's tons of examples of great men and women and people in history that have accomplished a lot of what you're trying to do. Of course, if you want to make your mark in the world, maybe you want to try something different. That's great. That's fine. But there's going to be some overlap. There's great Renaissance men yeah. in the past that you can always look up to and see how they did it, what they're doing. It gives you perspective and clarity and guidance for where you are yeah. in your current reality as we're just all on this forefront leading edge of every second, every millisecond, the new reality being created. How are we going to know what to shape it, where we're going, what decisions to make? It's super overwhelming when you start thinking about it. Yeah. Having the context and the perspective that history gives you, also relative to like geolocality -lo and different regions and different cultural backgrounds and things like that, is going to give you so much perspective to be able to operate as a global Renaissance citizen. <laughs> that's it. Copyright impending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's totally right. Because at, at the end of the day, like across recorded history, like, fundamentally humans haven't changed that much right and so evolution kind of been... stopped with civilization as soon as our strategy for survival switched from evolving 
and physically adapting to survive the harshness of the wild and predators and things like that and switch over to civilization, there's no longer a need to evolve and therefore natural selection really doesn't take place in the way that right. it, it, it's designed to or supposed to in order to make physical adaptations. Correct. And because of that, human beings act and respond to things pretty much the same way today as they did in history. And so you can look at the context of, okay, this thing happened. How did humans respond to that back then? You can see that. You can parallel that with what's going on today. How are humans going to respond to that very same thing today? People Probably are little, not too different. Right. People are generally predictable with, yes. by and large with things like that because our, <laughs> which, we're, still, we're still working on like monkey brain operating system. Dude, which here. is why history repeats itself so Windows many times. XP and it goes in this bad boy. <laughs> Windows XP. That's why it goes in cycles and that's why history repeats itself and everyone's like, oh, we can't learn from the past. It's like, because we're stuck yeah. in the past. Like, we haven't changed yeah. that much fundamentally. That's actually, that's a good way to put it. You're, you're biologically stuck in the past. And our society is in the future, but we're stuck in the past. Ooh. And, so and, and the further along we go, there's such a disparity. So understanding yeah. where you are and where you come from, being able to kind of track that curve and relative to having the self-awareness of where you are at both physically, mentally, and emotionally throughout that cultural dissonance yes. is super important. And that's the only way you're going to be yep. able to do anything about it and surf that wave. Totally. And that's why history and stuff like that is so important is because you can start to make those connections between what's going on in society and what people do about it. Lastly, we have spirituality and religion. Underrated. Underrated, for sure. And I think there's so many reasons why. I mean, one of them is just like, it depends on how deep you want to go and we will go, we'll go deep, deep into this for <laughs> sure. It also depends on your personal like views, perspectives and upbringings around this concept and stuff like that. But like one, like there's something, the belief that there's something outside yourself, something bigger than yourself. There's now a reason for, to have like greater purpose in your life and have something to move towards. And it kind of, it helps you create and ground those values that we talked about in the beginning, ground them to something. Like have a reason for them even being values and morals in your life. 100%. And that, again, that gives you a decision-making filter on how to go about living your life in a way that's gonna benefit you, benefit other people. 100%. It's. It's, the reason it's so underrated, I think, is because people get really, really caught up in the rat race of provability, for lack of a better Facts. term. Facts. But there, there's a little bit of a fallacy in that. And, and I think I can say this coming from a very strong academic background, like I've been through all of that. A lot of people, they're really limiting themselves based on to what is explicitly currently measurable right which in that metric has changed over history as well so that connects back to historical trends and cultural implications as well back in the day you couldn't measure certain things but that didn't mean they didn't exist and like yeah. nowadays we have a lot more sensitive measuring tools or whatever and there's a ton of things that people will generally accept may or may not exist but eventually we'll have the measurement tools to be able to measure them, right? So, and, and here, here's actually just an example that I thought of, which if anyone is, is questioning the validity of any kind of spirituality or, or higher power or whatever you want to call it, just to keep it simple here, if anyone's questioning that and be like, oh, but you can't measure, you can't prove it or whatever, but you still believe in dark matter? It's kind of cringe, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Because dark matter is is sort of like by definition like it, it's it's kind of the thing that oh it's out there and we see its effects but we can't measure we it. can't measure it and yet but you see its effects but just and because so, some yes. some guy with some letters after his name and some stuff you don't even understand on a whiteboard behind him says it and oh it must be real because science because science you know so it's it's this this a lot of science has really evolved into this scientism anyway. Yes. Where it, it kind of becomes its own religious-like Religion. structure. Straight up. Where you're, people are just blindly following these things because these yes. people with the letters at the last name who look a certain way or write certain things on a whiteboard tell them, so, oh, they must be smart. They must know what yes. we're talking about. It must be true, right? Which it, it doesn't really... 
make a lot of sense that you accept that and then reject something else where there's there's tons of examples we'll get into it but just trust me there's tons of examples of the effects of spiritual entities or higher powers or things happening that are inexplicable or unexplainable for lack of a better term or unmeasurable but you see the effects happening and yet people still reject the existence or the connection or anything like that yeah but Dark matter is fine. I just thought of that right now, and I thought that was pretty neat. No, that's a good comparison for sure. Um, Maybe I mean, dark matter is God. Whoa. Dark matter, God confirmed. There's a clickbait <laughs> title for you. Clickbait. Yeah, and I mean, that, yeah, one hundred percent. And that's something we're gonna explore quite a lot, I think. And that's gonna be that's gonna be because that definitely applies to every other category in in so many ways, um, and definitely you know, relates back to being the best you can be and, and you know, well, it's also fundamental potential. too, because like more, more in the lines of like, you know, what you, what you believe that you are as a person, you yeah. know, like a lot of people, um, might only believe that you're just limited to this human body and that's all you are. And you're just a bunch of electrical, electrochemical signals happening in a little sack of meat. That's fine. <laughs> but I think it goes beyond that. Like, you are, you're not that. You're not your body. You're not your mind. You're not your thoughts. You're a soul. Mm. And separating what you truly are from any aspect of your life, let alone every aspect of your life, as a lot of people do, is you're severing a deep connection with your fundamental essence of reality. Yes. And, and how can you expect that not to be limiting your life? Mm. Right? Right? So it's all, it's all about the relationship of, of connecting and disconnecting to intentionally to the right things or the wrong things, right? So, so a lot of people are over-connected and they want to like disconnect from a lot of times like society or distractions and things like that. But real, realistically, a lot of it's really less about disconnecting, more about reconnecting back to yourself, your soul, and, and why we're here, your fundamental essence the and purpose. That matter, yeah. And again, that comes back to focus, right? It's what do you put those resources and that attention on? Exactly. It really helps. And that applies to all of these different categories, like 100%. Um, and that, yeah, that's just so, so, so fundamental to human development mm -hmm. in any field, in any pursuit that you go after. I feel like we said that about every one of our categories, which is why we chose them. Dude, which is why we chose them, because anything you can do will fall under one of these categories. I think so. I think... We'll see. I, I think guess. so. If you guys have any other categories, I don't know who someone's listening and maybe want to add, want to, hey, you should do this category. You don't agree with something, let us know. We'll, we'll work with it. But at this me. is our best guess to this moment and, and our best, most useful structure of kind of what we're doing. Absolutely. Because part so of this is, is our like, structure that we're going to be variable within. Totally. This is a structure. We're going to be variable about pursuing different things. But honestly, part of this too is like, we want to go pursue a lot of these things and like learn all these things and become a quest. this full, like we want to fulfill our own potentials in life so that we can better bring value to the world and help people. And this is kind of like our own journey of doing this and kind of seeing what happens and documenting that process a little bit, um, which absolutely should be fun. I think, I hope. Well, if it's not fun, it's fulfilling. Hopefully. We'll report back on that. We'll report back on that. We'll 45 there. years. Uh, I think we can get... Anyway, um, so I guess at the end of this, any of these, these podcasts that we do, um, we'll be asking some questions, and we're going to ask ourselves the questions. Only fair. So that we can provide like our own insights and, and thoughts on this first but the first question will be what is a paradigm that you see in the world that you would like to shatter like to shatter i love that that verbiage very visceral what is a paradigm that i'd like to shatter yes i think the biggest one that i see and and the reason i choose this is because it's so fundamental across everything and i see it everywhere and i really think there's a fundamental connection to to base reality here and what what universe or simulation or whatever you want to call it that we're living yes. in i feel like it's so fundamental is this idea of binary duality that is the paradigm that is so prevalent across 
across the board. You see it in in politics, in people just how they talk about success and failure, emotions, things like this. You see it everywhere, right? The idea that things are either one way or the other, no in between. You know, politics is the most readily available example off the top of my head right now. You have the idea that you're either a Republican or a Democrat. If you don't agree with something that a Republican says, you must be a Democrat, full stop, all the way. If you don't agree with something a Democrat says, you're now a Republican, right? It doesn't quite make yep. sense because you get all these people who are in the middle somewhere and yet they're just pressured or manipulated or brainwashed for, actually that's pretty accurate, that's a pretty accurate term, into thinking that, oh, I must be one or the other, mm -hmm. right? There's no room for anything in the middle, right? Because it's like, oh, I agree with this party on this topic, therefore I must be that party. Yes. And then you come up to some, another issue, and the, here's the problem with this, you come up with another issue, and be like, oh, this my party that I've decided to be part of thinks this way about that issue, therefore I think that way about that issue because I'm part of the party. You end up delegating and exporting, outsourcing yes. your, your thought process, your individual choice yes. to an external group. You outsource your thought process. You outsource your thought process. You're no longer thinking as for yourself anymore. You don't have a choice anymore. You've already decided you're just going to let someone else make that choice for you. And so that's really the problem I see with this binary duality thing that people have where it's just extrapolating just to the endpoints. Now, this is that's the main paradigm that I would like to shatter. And I'm going to shatter it by making the realization that life is about dual polarities but not binaries, right? So there's a difference, right? Polarities, dual duality, things like that, those exist and are absolutely fundamental, but they exist on a spectrum, right? Facts. Most people will extrapolate themselves to the endpoints of the spectrum without any acknowledgement of the existence of any, any in between, right? But there's always gonna be somewhere in between. Like it's not you're right or you're wrong, success or fail, right? It's to what extent, to what extent are you right, to what extent are you wrong, to what extent did you succeed? To what extent did you fail? Right? So this is kind of the idea of, of, of understanding dualities in a little bit different way from just good or bad, light or dark. Right? Yep. And, and this is so fundamental because it, it really, understanding the spectrums themselves and the contrasts between mm. the endpoints is really what creates the reality that you, you, you see, right? You can only have hot because you have cold, only have light because you have dark, yep. right? They're self-sufficient, basically, in, in, in how they create itself. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's, dude, I think that's so big for people to realize. I mean, you kind of made two different points. Like, everything exists on the spectrum. It, that, dude, that's so big because, again, everybody thinks about things as this or that, right? These, these dichotomies of good or evil. It's like hot or cold, black or white. It's like dude, neither of those exists without the other. Absolutely. It's like if you, if didn't, you didn't, have didn't have one, if you, if you destroyed one, you'd by necessity destroy the other. And this is why yeah. polarity is so crucial to fundamental reality because when you mm -hmm. it's just this mm -hmm. idea of, of balance and harmony and Correct. equals and opposites it's, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's a give and take it's a yeah it's an input and an output it's it's really just fundamental like it's just it's the law of exchange like if i create something that fundamentally creates the opposing polarity to balance right it's yes. this idea of just like net zero yeah change in energy or there's this, this law of like constant entropy throughout the universe so like if i and, and this actually gets into some pretty deep deep more spiritual concepts especially if you want to go in more like the eastern spiritualism like hinduism or buddhism this idea of desire and lack right and mm -hmm. and, and being yep. and this is fundamentally why they they tell you to detach from desire is because desire fundamentally creates the lack because if you want something you only want it because you don't have it, right? I want an apple. If I had the apple, I wouldn't want an apple. I already have the apple, right? So yeah. me feeling the desire of wanting an apple, it's fundamentally creating the lack that I don't have an apple. And if Daniel doesn't want an apple, he doesn't have the lack for an apple. Well, it's the idea that lack creates desire. I think it's the other way around as well. 
lack does create desire because they're opposing ends of the polarity. Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay. But desire fundamentally creates lack of power. And if I get rid of the desire, I don't feel the lack, and therefore it's not that's there. That's true. That's right? true. And this is why you you have these ideas in these Eastern spiritualism, and, and and we'll get into like the whole karmic cycles and things like that too, because it's very related. Fundamentally, the idea of karma is that every desire must be fulfilled. Right? That's kind of like sure. the karmic law. So you're going to keep repeating lives by this philosophy until you fulfill a desire or keep, keep repeating it until you actually fulfill it. So this is what keeps people in that cycle until you detach from everything and you no longer have the desire and therefore you no longer have the lack and you can actually just not be on that wheel anymore. Yeah. Right? That's, that's a very, very spark notes version of what's totally. going on. The contrast, contrast is big because it, like you said, it, it, contrast creates reality. It's like fundamental. That gives yeah. everything, it gives you the perspective. You, dude, even just from like a, a spatial perspective, like mm -hmm. contrast of no table, table, no table, table for our listeners on, on the yeah. non YouTube listeners. It's, it's a spatial contra con contrast as well. Mm -hmm. And then you, you bring that back to the spectrum idea, right? About a spectrum instead of being like this duality. It's, it's directional, right? The, the duality of the endpoints creates the two directions that mm. you can go back and forth between. So it, it, you need the contrast of, let's say, light and dark, right? You need the contrast of light on one side and dark on the other side. It's not like it's, it's also not two different things. It's two ends, two directions of the it's same just, thing. Yeah, it's, the spectrum is really what the singular essence is. Yes. The polarity is really just an expression of to what extent is it relative to, to the other contrast to mm -hmm. the other contrast yes. so so it's so typically it manifests itself in like the endpoints are like on or off <laughs> for lack of right better, not quite because let's not say quite. you turn the that's lights not, off in here could it get darker it could yes because that's why you have like dimmer switches dimmer and potentiometers and, and things like that but still light it's this idea elsewhere. of like the presence and absence of things well to what extent there can always be more of something and yes. there can always be less of something maybe until you get absolute zero but that kind of that's conditional. But even then it's conditional, It's right? conditional so for, for your spectrum. It's, it's directional. It's this biphasic thing. And mm -hmm. I think it's important, too, for people to understand, like, at least this is important, something that has helped me quite a lot in, in using this idea of a spectrum and applying it to things is where are you on that spectrum it, with, with anything, right? So it doesn't, like, matter what you're talking about. Where are you on that spectrum? Like, how close to one end, how close to the other end are you? And then can you move yourself in one direction or the other mm. and i think the only way because pe so people talk about this all the time like in po politics i guess is a really easy example of this people talk about like neutral all the time right what is neutral well neutral is kind of in the middle not too far to one side what not too far to the other side but this is relative because you only know where neutral is based on your perspectives of the endpoints. How so, far away you are from one endpoint relative to the other endpoint, you can kind of gauge exactly. so those distances. The problem, the problem arises when you only expose yourself to one end of the spectrum. So extremes of the spectrum are not a good place to hang out long term. However, I do think it is important to explore both ends of a spectrum. You have to know the extent of your constraints. Yes. So basically, like, let's say you've grown up like a democratic and that is all you know. And you're probably going to maybe just think that you're kind of moderate. Like you don't have extreme viewpoints because that's, that's all you've been exposed to. And then you go out in the world and you meet somebody who's maybe like more like technically politically moderate. They seem extremely right to you. Like it's to, relative. to the right end of the spectrum to you because it's so relative. So the only way to really know what neutral feels like is to go and experience all the way to the left, all the way to the right, and not stay on any one side, but be able to go back and forth. And that's you, where you, you understand your, your boundaries. The, con the concept of neutral because you have the perspective of the relativism between the two directions. I mean, all it's you, not endpoints, it's directions. 100%, dude. That's great. Like You've mapped your boundaries, right? If you're yes. trying to find the midpoint of the line in, from a mathematical sense, it's like, well, what line? <laughs> you have to kind of figure that out. Yes. Right, you have to figure out. Okay, this point over here and this point over here I have to know where those are before I can find a midpoint. After that, it's super simple, right? Because I have the reference yes. of what distance I need to be relative. relative to those endpoints. If relative. I just have one of them, I have no idea how far out I'm going. I could be super totally. close. I could be super far because it's all relative. It is all relative. The other interesting thing about a spectrum, though, I think too, is 
I guess when we when we talk about like development or growth or change over time and like a lot of people can be intimidated by by changing and, and moving in a direction down the spectrum like let's say you want to achieve something that's kind of down towards the other end of the spectrum and you're pretty far away from it right the thing about a spectrum is there are infinite points on a spectrum, right? That's, that's the nature of a spectrum, mm -hmm. right? There are infinite, like, singularity points. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, most people see, like, rungs on a ladder, mm. right? If you're trying to get to the top of a ladder, you climb these rungs. You have one rung, and then the next rung is a certain distance like pre away, predetermined distances else, away, right? Yeah. Where, let's say the rungs are really far apart, and you can't reach the next step. Well, the cool thing about a spectrum is there's infinite amount of rungs. So you can scale things. You can always make progress. You can scale things to a level that you can take that next rung. So you can, there is, you can always make progress. You can always find either a progression or a regression of something that fits you because you can scale it because mm -hmm. everything exists on a spectrum, not that, a ladder. That's actually, that's actually super... That, that's actually a super good analogy, yeah. Like comparing things to ladders, that's like a level level one realization when you kind of realize like, oh, things aren't yes or no, success or failure, whatever. Yes. There's, there's levels in between, right? That's kind of level one. You get these levels. And then, then you go even deeper. It's like, no, we got even more layers in between that. And then it's all just one continuous yeah. spectrum. It's actually well, funny. Like we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this later when we talk about like quantum physics or say, but it, it actually just reminded me of this whole idea of like, you have the quantized energy levels of an electron. That's fundamentally where a lot of quantum physics is used and, and comes from. But then even within that, you have like, like this fine structure where you have like different energy levels mm -hmm. um, of different electrons, you know, within the same within the same orbital necessarily. And then you have like hyperfine structures, and and you end up getting these like increasingly fine differences just based on like little intrinsic things about the electron, like the spin, angular momentum whether or not an electric field is applied, you got Zeeman shifts, like you got all these different things that make your energy not so concretely quantum anymore, even though it yes. still fundamentally behaves by the same principles, you're no longer on just a ladder spectrum. Correct. Let me give you an example of this that might make it a little more applicable. Yeah, that's more people who applicable. aren't like just <laughs> absolute nerd status. Thanks. Um, it, let's say you're, you're trying to do a push-up and you've never done a push-up before, you can't do a push-up but you can do a push-up from your knees, okay? You're trying to bridge the gap between doing a push-up from your knees and a push-up from your feet, like a full push-up, right? And you're like, ah, I can't do the full push-up, but I can do the kneeling push-up. How am I ever gonna get there? It's like, that's a rung on a ladder that you can't reach. Big jump. You can bridge that gap because it, a push-up exists on a spectrum of difficult, easy, and you're in the middle right now on kneeling push-up. And so you can do a full push-up off your knees but you elevate your hands up onto a bench, right? So now you're at less of an angle, there's less gravity, or there's less body weight, and now you can do a full push-up, but your hands are just elevated up on mm -hmm. a bench. And then, yeah, you make another jump. You can, this is infinitely scalable. You can make, you can lower that bench a little bit. You yeah. can lower that bench a little bit. You can wrap a band around you, so the band is helping you out a little bit. 100%. Like, this is just an example of a push-up. You push got tons of variables in that example, too. Until... Like, for one, the angle of, like, your body from, like, standing to, like, full push-up position, you have tons of angles to work with. Literally infinite You got angles. your knees, that's another leverage point. You got so, bands, different different forces you can manipulate. Like, tons yes. of things you can do. So without making this too complicated, like, that's just an example of, there's always going to be an in-between point between where you are, at point A and point B, right? There are infinite points, infinite progressions, infinite scalabilities between where you are and where you want to go. So when you say that's out of reach, I don't believe you. Out of reach <laughs> and the idea that you have hit a plateau is a, lack, is a lack of creativity. Mm. It's a very scarcity based mindset. It is a lack of the ability to, creativity in order to find those next progressions, those scalabilities on that spectrum. But understanding that it is a spectrum and those in between points exist is hugely freeing. Yeah, right? dude, that, that's actually incredibly related to, this is pretty much related to the same thing, but it's another kind of paradigm that I see a lot. It's just a different manifestation on it that I would like to yes. shatter as well. It's this attachment to results, right? 
and it's very related to this idea of binary outcomes mm -hmm. because you have a success or Dude, a failure, yes. right? So you have this attachment like, oh, I, I am only valid or good or whatever if I succeed X. Yeah. Right? <laughs> or succeed, succeed in X or achieve X. But if I fail, that means I'm a failure. You see how you're attaching your identity to an outcome? Mm -hmm. Success, I'm a success. Fail, I'm a failure. Where really a more useful way to operate in the world is to detach yourself from that outcome-based thinking and just attach yourself to the growth and the lessons that you got from it. Yes. The moment I realized that everything in, in the world, like everything in the universe, everything happens for me, not to me. They're all just learning experience and I'm attaching myself to or, or have the perspective that everything is just a vehicle for my growth. Yep. Nothing more, nothing less. Super powerful transformation for me. 100%. Because now I look at things like, oh, I achieved this. I succeeded in this. Cool. How did I grow? What did I learn? Indeed. That's the first question I ask myself. Oh, I failed. I didn't get what I wanted. I tried for this and I came up short. Cool. What did I learn? How did I grow? Paradigm shattered. Shattered. Okay. That, 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 those are probably the main, the main ones for me. The other question... The other question that um, we'll ask, I guess. that uh, we think is pretty interesting is, since it, the whole idea of being a Renaissance man, we've talked about this so much, it's just connecting different dots from different perspectives in different areas to create these new perspectives and be creative yeah. about it within those constraints. I want to know what are the furthest dots that you've connected? Things that are seemingly completely unrelated, but you've managed to make that connection and found a really unique, interesting perspective to add to that conversation. Hmm. Well, okay, I have an example. Um, I am I'm trash, by the way, at thinking of examples like this on the spot. So <laughs> this is the only one that I was able to, I guess. We'll get to more. We'll have a lot of the chances. The only one that I can these. think of at the moment, I guess. I mean, it's not like hugely profound and like, world changing but only it's an example so. i guess <laughs> is connection so and i kind of noticed this when i was driving on the freeway the other day is it the the difference or the i guess the similarity between like driving in traffic and like investing in stocks <laughs> nice <laughs> yes we like that and so if you're investing in stocks like by and large, there's like a couple ways you can do it, right? You can you can have an investment that's meant more for the long term, that you're you're not really going to do a whole lot of, and it's a safe bet, and you're just you're going to ride it out for a long time to get like compounding returns over time, or you can be in the short term and like play for like quick gains, right? That is exactly like if you're driving on the freeway, it depends on how far you're going, like what lane you choose to what drive in, you be. <laughs> what decisions you make while you're driving. If you are like on a road trip from here to like, you're driving like a hundred miles, you're driving a ways, then what lane are you going to be? You're probably going to go all the way to the left, right? Because across the span of the hundred miles, that lane is probably going to move the fastest across the whole trip your average speed is going to be right higher. your average speed will be higher in that lane whereas it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be faster all the time right it might start to slow down you might get some traffic jams but you're probably going to stay in that lane right because you know it's going to get you there the fastest across the span of the whole trip right whereas if you're only going like three exits down the freeway mm -hmm. like and you got to get there quick you're trying to make good time you're going to find whatever hole is open currently. Whether or not it closes later, you don't care because you're just trying to get there now. And so you might start in the left lane because it's moving faster, but as soon as that one slows down, you're going to get over to the right lane because it's moving faster currently. You're going to lane hop to the fastest moving lane well, because you, you're just you, trying to you make you have to also quick be, gains in the short term. 100%, dude. And then you also have to be in the right position when you need to be. You have to be in the right lane when the exit comes. Exactly. Right? So you got to be in, in the right stock, so in the right position. It's strategically setting yourself up for for the success kind of like right now yeah, versus like you got to sell at the right playing time. <laughs> the longer game and that's the same thing like with stocks it's like yeah if you see an opening you're going to take it now because you're just looked at these short term returns mm -hmm. you you don't really care about that as much in the longer game you see a stock 
that you like have faith in for the long term kind of start to dip, you don't worry because you think, okay, it, it's going to rebound, it's going to come back, and I care about the long term anyway. So anyway, that's just kind of a couple of things that I started to connect, and this applies now. See, this is the cool thing about when you connect two things, that probably means they connect to more things. That connection is an, in of itself a tool. Yes. That you can now be like, oh, this connection know. fits over here too. Yes. So it, it's the principle, it's the idea of, again, allocating your resources based upon short-term versus long-term and that what game you're playing. Mm -hmm. right? And even then it's relating back to making sure, you know, realizing everything's on a spectrum as well. It's like, well, long-term, short-term, those aren't just two things. Like long-term doesn't mean only one time. Yeah. Short-term doesn't mean only one time. There's a whole range of things there. So understanding... Yo, where you connect with and then that. you want to connect this to something we talked about earlier on macro and micro focus right micro focus is short-term sure. gains i'm right here right now mm -hmm. i want to make as much gains as i can right now it's, macro focus is about how far can i take this thing over the long run and what's the, the right best way to do what's that the, what's the total overall outcome you know yeah risk adjusting because if you're swapping back and forth and you're trying to do that for 100 miles so many things could go wrong right you could more chances to get an accident because you're doing that for longer. Mm -hmm. You might, you know, get caught up in a bad lane and get stuck, get stuck in traffic where you, oh, I should have just stuck in the lane that typically goes faster. If you've been doing that all the time, a cop might pull you over. You got tons of things that could go wrong yep. by playing those short-term strategies over the long term. So it's yes. applying like yes. finding what is the best practices in sequence for what you're trying to do. It's contextual. It's all, it contextual, all contextual because it's all in that spectrum, right? One hundred percent.